welcome everyone. Welcome to Achievement Unlocked, Drive Development, Increase Velocity with uh, whatever. <laughs> but thank you to organizers for this last minute substitution. I'm really happy to be here at All Things Open. You will see why. I'm Gleb Bakhmutov. I run engineering at Cypress.io. I've been doing it for two and a half years, and I've been using Cypress for a year before. Before we do this, I have to do this announcement that our planet is in immediate danger. It's completely out of balance right now. If you watch what's happening in Alaska, in the Arctic Circle, in Europe, the heat waves are showing that the system is blinking red. It's coming apart at the seams. And if we don't do anything immediately, pretty much billions of people will die. So we have to act quickly and we have to act today. I'm changing my behavior. So one child, no flying, well, I'm trying to scale down. No driving, electrical bicycle, electrical power, and so on. Most important is that we have to tell others that this is a danger. So I'm telling you because I can influence my family, my coworkers, and my audience. And you should do the same. You have to vote like it matters because in a couple of years, if you don't vote, it's not going to matter anymore. So uh, I'm part of Citizen Climate Lobby. We're trying to put carbon pricing in the United States. I assume that some or majority of people here are American citizens. You should do the same and get your representative to support this. As a personal pledge, I pledge that if your company is working on a green solution or climate change solution, even if you're a commercial entity, I volunteer to help in any way I can, mostly end-to-end -end testing. Uh, example, fab.earth. Okay, so that was emotional because this directly affects my life, the life of future generation, the life of my child, and so on. Okay, now smooth transition to Cypress IO and testing and testing everything that runs on the web. We're a small company, around 30 people right now. We've been growing, so it used to be four or five people when I joined, but now we are expanded. We are pretty much all remote. We're based in Atlanta, but I'm the only one in Boston. Uh, a Cypress test looks like this. You visit a website, could be local host, could be remote, and then you type into boxes. And then you check how many items this to-do list shows. This is a typical end-to-end -end Cypress test. And then you say Cypress open. And this is a, a GUI that opens and runs either a single test file, and you can see the website under the test and all the tasks kind of controlling things. There's a file watch, so if you change something, the test reruns automatically so you can work quickly. You also see dumb snapshots as shown right now, where if you hover over command, you see how the application looked at that particular moment. On CI, you run Cypress run, and then you run each spec at a time. There is no more file watching because you're just running all the tests. There is no more dumb snapshots because you don't need them. But what you do get is every time there is a test failure, you get a screenshot of your application at that instant automatically. Even better, you get automatic video of a whole test run on every platform, every operating system, nothing to install. You get it right out of the box. So we were trying to sell this. We were trying to approach companies and say, hey, if you pay us money, we'll give you this cool testing tool. And that didn't work. So in May of 2017, we announced that we're going open source all the things, which explains why I'm so excited to be at this conference, because it's literally the name of a conference, just you know, different order. So we announced it in May, and we actually made the repo after preparing it, after simplifying everything. We made it open exactly two years ago. And this is what happened afterwards. Before that, the repo was there, but it only was an issue tracker for people who had problems. But after we actually put code and open source, and everyone could just, the thing skyrocketed. And I'm really happy to be part of this journey. This is a typical reaction from our users. I just felt in love with Cypress.io. So we have hundreds of tweets like that. People use words like love and Cypress and testing in the same sentence, and that doesn't happen. So we still have this as a goal. We still have as a goal, build the best end-to-end -end test runner in the world. <coughs> we also have as a goal to teach developers how to use it, how to write good end-to-end -end tests. And then we have as a goal to teach developers how to run their tests on CI. Don't 
let someone else write your task. You as a developer should be able to write the software, the task, and run the task, and be responsible for the tasks. In this presentation, I'll show a little bit of my thinking about testing, and then I'll explain how a company actually works by giving things away. We give, you know. And then I'll show a preview of what we're working on right now. So um, I'm Gleb Bakhmatov. I have hundreds of open source projects, mostly in JavaScript. I have a blog, personal site, Twitter, all there. And these slides are on cypressslides.com. Um, so why do I write tests? After programming for close to 30 years, I figure out one thing about myself, my code never works. It doesn't work on the first try, it doesn't work on the second try, and usually it doesn't work on the tenth try. So I doubt myself. Every time I write a piece of code, I know it's not gonna run. So tests allow me to actually uh, release the doubt. People tell me, well, you should write that specific type of test or that. They talk about testing pyramid, and today I'm here telling you, like, don't talk about testing pyramid. Like, that solves nothing. Instead, if I have a piece of code, I want to write a test. If I have an API, I want to write a test. If I have a web application, I want to write a test. So you have to realize there is only a test for a thing I doubt works. It doesn't matter what you call it. So if a thing is a function, you write function test. We call those kind of tests unit tests, but who cares? If a thing is a component, well, you write a test for that component, where you, for example, mount it, and then you interact, and then you get something like this, where you can see it. If a thing is an API, well, you write an API test, where you just call API, get something back, and you inspect the response. Maybe there is a GUI attached to your test. If a thing is a web application, like in this case, you write a test. And then the test runs, and you can see what happened. If a thing is web application style, not functionality, but the style, the colors, the fonts, you write a test where you take snapshots. And there are usually services or libraries that compare previous snapshots visually to the new snapshots. In this case, if someone goes and changes some SVG field color, the pizza is no longer yellow but green, right? Well, your test has revealed it. If a thing is an Electron app, you write a test. So recently we released an alpha, alpha, beta preview, alpha version of support for testing Electron applications where you just say Electron visit. Instead of Sci visit, you say Electron visit. And you give us the file name of your code that creates the Electron window. And then we actually call it for you. And so Cypress can run your Electron app and be testing it. If a thing is accessibility, you write a test. In this case, you inject X, which is a really popular accessibility library. It's just JavaScript. And then you say, check the color contrast. So you can write lots of lots of lots of types of tests. And we've been trying to create Cypress as a platform where it's just JavaScript and you can write additional plugins for doing those different types of tests. And people have been writing them. Um, on our page of plugins, we have more than 75. Some of them, you know, we've written, but majority are outside contributors, right? Something specific to frameworks, something specific to visual testing, something specific for reporters and preprocessors. So here's an example that's very realistic and I think kind of brings a point why we are doing this plugins model. People always ask us, well, what should I be testing in my application? Because you can design tests in many, many ways. So we've written as an answer code coverage plugin. So imagine you have an application. In this case, you have to do app, right? Because you're not allowed to show any other apps. So what kind of features does it have, right? So you can com come up with like a list of features and you have like a Microsoft Word document that says, well, feature A, users should be able to add items. Feature B, user can complete items, and feature C, user can delete to do items. So you come up with that list with your product owner manually or in your tracking software. And then you start writing tests and you keep track of what you have tested manually. So you say, okay, I have a test, it's called adds to this, so for feature A. I have a test called completes to this for feature B. Um, I don't have any test that has 
delete to do in its name, so it's missing, so I'll add it. So you manually complete the picture. And I think this manual writing and matching and writing and matching is good when you're just starting. But after a while, it becomes really hard to keep in sync with your tests and your features where you have new features appearing, old features changing or being deprecated. I think it's really hard. It's hard because the first test is usually the easiest one to keep track manually. Uh, two more tests arrive, it's fine. But after a while, you have hundreds of tests and you get completely swamped with that information. And you no longer know if your application has been tested or not. So instead of manual way, you can use code coverage to keep track of your uh, code you, you've been testing. But it's kind of different. So imagine you're implementing feature A and you're starting from scratch, which is the best situation. So you've written some source code. Nice. You implement feature B. You probably add more code, you refactor existing code, but those two features are implemented in your application source code. Then you add feature C, and again, you add code, you refactor, but what's happening is that somehow those features are implemented and expressed in your source code. So if you write tests and you can somehow find out which lines of your source code those tests exercise when they're run, let's say those green lines, then you can say, well, those red lines are not covered by my tests. And then you have to be a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes and say, well, which feature is implemented in those red lines? You can have to guess by looking at it, but then you can say, well, it probably deletes to do. So you add one more test, run code coverage tool again, and after the test complete, you see everything is green. So you know that you covered all the tests. So the code coverage doesn't directly tell you which features you have implemented, but indirectly, because those features are implementing your code and you measure the code coverage. And it doesn't mean that if you achieve 100% code coverage, that you achieve 0% bugs. Uh, the first reason is because of this indirection. Uh, your code might be implementing the features incorrectly, so even if you cover 100%, it's not the features that are functioning correctly. And the second thing is that your test might be very unrealistic. For example, you only use one type of uh, email, or you use you know, normal kind of typical names, and then you find out that someone with very short last name cannot actually use your system. So there are two sources of errors that even 100% code coverage doesn't catch. So in our implementation of code coverage plugin, we still leave it up to you to instrument your code, but then Cypress runs the tests, and then Cypress reports results. So we found out after trying this out that end-to-end -end tests are extremely effective at covering a lot of application code. Uh, so there's uh, Nicole from CircleCI, she's not here. So she talked about how they actually increase the code coverage through unit test from zero to 80% during her talk. And I was like, well, that's nice. So here's an example of a test, a single test that visits the app, finds the input box, types free to do's, and then confirms that there are free to do's in the list. So how much code do you think this test, the single test covers? Um, let's say the table. Do you think less than 50% or more than 50%? More than 50%. More than 60 or less than 60? More, right? And I'll give you just the right number because we're very close. So 72%, right? A single test because it actually runs the whole thing. It has to render everything, right? It has to do a couple of actions because we actually did enter free to do's. And so what do we do after that? So we actually drill down and we go and figure out what we haven't tested. So people, when they say, I'm aiming for 100% code coverage or 90% or 75, 80, whatever your number, they take that code coverage number and they think that's the destination, that's the goal. And what I'm about to show you is that's not the right solution or right question. The code coverage is not the destination, it's the guide to get to higher quality coverage not itself a destination. So here's an example. So this particular test that entered free to do's, if I drill down into the file that's like with list coverage, it's a Redux store, and it has a big switch statement. It literally has every action my app can do, like add to do, complete to do, and so on. So I can see every line and how many times it was hit during my tests. 
So I can see that adding to do's was actually hit three times because we did add three items into the list. And when I look at the yellow statements and the red lines, so the yellow are the branches not taken in the if statement or switch statement. And the red lines are lines that never were exercised during my test. So where should I actually write tests? Well, to hit those lines. It becomes almost like a game to come up with tests for those features. So I know I have to write tests for deleting to-dos, uh, editing to-dos, completing to-dos, and so on. So you see how coverage just tell me, this is what you're missing, take this path. It's not the ultimate number that matters. So you write more end-to-end -end tests, and they all pass, and we get 99.26%. So 0.26% is kind of an interesting number, right? Because 99.26 is not 100. So where are we losing this? This little, little rectangle, right? In this one particular file for selectors, we missed it. If we go down and look at this file, we see that there is, uh, again, a selector statement that says what to render every time the user clicks on, on those filters, all to do items, active to do items, or completed to do items. But our selector inside our file has a default statement, right? And this statement says, hey, just throw an error if you ever reach it. Now, can we write an end-to-end -end test to, to actually reach that line? We can't, right? Because in a well-designed application that's actually implemented correctly, that is impossible. We should never hit that line. But it's a good code, it's robust code, so if somehow we use that component somewhere else, it might be possible to hit that line. So instead, if we want to reach that particular line, we have to write a unit test. Right? But test that doesn't go through UI. So we just write a unit test. We directly import that component, and we write expect, if we call it with invalid selector, to throw an error. So we run just that um, a test, in that case, there is no UI, so there is no application with Cypress Lowest. It just runs the unit test. We see that there is code coverage. And then if we look at code coverage for that particular file, we can see that we covered just one line in that, if, uh, in that switch statement because we really targeted our test to just hit that line and confirm the behavior that it does throw an error. Now, if you run all the tests together, the Cypress code coverage plugin takes the end-to-end -end code coverage and a unit test code coverage and combines them together, and that's how we generate 100% code coverage. Nice job, code coverage plugin. The interesting thing about this, we specifically didn't want to put it in the core of a test runner itself. Because the core is complex and large, and sometimes the release process takes longer than you or even our team would like. So by putting it in a plugin that's separate, where we can iterate and release very, very quickly, we allow for faster feature delivery. And we're trying to keep the core as small, and if we really need to, maybe expose one more seam that plugin can use. The same with uh, electron testing plugin. We're exposing a few seams and then doing the most of the work in a plugin. So end-to-end -end tests are extremely effective at covering your application code. Not just application, very good at exercising your configuration, all your environment variables, you know, the things that should never break but are usually broken after a couple of deploys. We exercise the entire stack. If you allow your backend Ajax request to go through, your end-to-end -end tests are behaving exactly like a real user would, and so they would go for the entire stack to make sure all parts of the system are working. And so to me, the pyramid, even though I don't like the pyramid at all, but it should be upside down. It should be a pizza slice. I think the end-to-end -end test where you behave and test like a real user is extremely important to the real users. I'm not saying don't write unit tests, but unit tests are still extremely important to me as a developer. But who's pay paying the bills? The end users are. Other people have noticed this. So there is now a trend, kind of exemplified by this tweet that says, unpopular opinion, well, let's change it. You should write end-to-end -end and integration tests first, always. 
Only when end-to-end -end integration test fails should you even think about writing unit tests. And that was the approach, right, that I showed in our code coverage. We started with end-to-end -end because they're so effective. And wherever we could not reach through the user interface, then we only have written unit tests to reach those uh, code paths. Um, we're trying to be thought leaders in this, so the guide to how to design your tests are all in our docs, our API docs, and our examples where we show how we're thinking about tests and how we design the tests and how we think about testable web applications. Okay, the talk that everyone just loves to have in programming community, let's talk about money. A couple of months ago, there was a talk at JustConf EU about a company that should not be named, actually it is named here, <laughs> okay, NPM register, right? It's an integral part of JavaScript world, and yet it's VC backed. It's actually backed by the same venture capital that Cypress is backed. So how can we guarantee that our funding model is not gonna affect the decisions and affect the community? So how does Cypress make money? First of all, we don't make money by limiting the features or selling license to the test runner. Everything that I've shown to you, all the plugins, the test runner itself is completely open source and will remain so, right? So we're just giving it away. Instead, we decided, well, we're gonna sell additional services. And those services will make sense for larger companies, not to individual small projects or individual users. And those services are completely complementary. So everything that you will see later, you can implement yourself. It's just cheaper to pay someone for, for doing this. So the paid features that we do are like recording the test artifacts. You know, those screenshots and videos that I said Cypress saves by default, well, it saves it. But how do you look at that? How do you look at this in a convenient manner? So we do that. How do you run lots of tests quickly once you, know, you grow to certain size of tests. How do you work as a team through GitHub conveniently? So we noticed that, for example, modern CIs, their UI is great if you want to look at console logs. Get it? That's why console logs. So we decided the first thing we want to do is just store your artifacts. They get uploaded automatically once you say Cypress run dash dash record. And your token, your, your little private token, is just environment variable. So then, doesn't matter which CI you use, everything gets uploaded automatically to our dashboard where you have a private web application where you can see the results. And you see results kind of like this, where each test file is shown with you know, durations, number of tests, and underlined, you can see console log, screenshots, and video. We're actually working on the design of a page to allow you to do you know, common things once you have a lot of tests, like filtering. Or how to inspect even the failed test quickly and conveniently? How do you show all the information about that particular commit, that particular failure, and everything that happened during the test? So we're thinking even of showing additional information. Here's how long the test spent in different steps, and here's the, you know, the source code for that particular failure. So you understand what failed on CI very, very quickly. And once you have lots of end-to-end -end tests, even if each test is fast, when you take a lot of them, they probably will run slower. For me, the tolerance is probably like three minutes. Anything after three minutes, I kind of lose track. So if your CI you know, end to end test phase takes longer than three minutes, I think you should parallelize. And so we implement parallelization. It becomes part of our SaaS offering. Is it crucial to you as individual user? No. But is it crucial to enterprise that has lots of developers? Yes. So the beauty of that is that you just have to add a single CLI flag, and we figure out everything automatically, the whole load balancing. And so even our own tests for this web software used to take, let's say, almost 23 minutes, and then they take less than four. And we actually did test runs on different number of CI machines that we spin, and so if we spin 10 machines, it's one-tenth of a total duration, which is pretty good. You know, GitHub like sponsored lunch, and GitHub became such an integral part of everyone's workflow, right? Where you open pull requests, where you merge it, you review on GitHub. So we decided 
to make de developing software and testing software easy as a team through GitHub. So we introduced GitHub integration. We just install Cypress GitHub app, and you say, hey, I want to install it on my uh, Cypress project. You give it permissions, and it's only read permissions to the meta information, not to the source code itself. You pick the project that you want to connect, and then you say, hey, do I want like a single check you know, per run, or do I want separate uh, status checks for each spec file? It's up to you, however both you want to do. Be. So by group, you'll just have extra check. So you can quickly see like which this group of end-to-end -end tests has failed. Or you can have a single status check for each test file. In that case, you'll have lots of more status checks. But also, if something fails, you immediately know which particular end-to-end -end spec file is failing. Uh, my favorite feature here is that that GitHub integration even comments on pull requests. If, if there is a failure, it will come in and say, hey, something failed. It will give you the name of a, of a failing test, you know, the link to the dashboard project, and even a little thumbnail of a screenshot at failure. So you can quickly kind of see if, if you can um, triage the issue quickly. And if nothing fails, then it's good, right? You just have basic information, and you're safe, and you can merge with pull request. Nothing is failing. Uh, one thing I want to discuss really quickly is um, Cypress and open source community. We build Cypress on all open source tools. And I'm not even talking about like JavaScript and TypeScript and VS Code. I'm talking about like Mocha, jQuery, Synon, Chai. All those tools are part of Cypress core. So when you do npm install Cypress, like my t-shirt says on the back, you actually install those tools included in our um, tool. So a couple of weeks ago, I was as always, and as, as some people in this room, I was browsing Twitter, and I saw, saw this tweet from Christian Alfoni, and he was um, announcing a release of a new, lib of a new version of a, his library for state management called Cerebral GS. And the library is, is nice, but what I noticed here is I was like, wow, look at this to-dos app. Look at to do's like nice red color, high contrast. Look at those like footer. Like I can actually read it in a screenshot of a tweet. And, and usually you've, you've seen my to do you know, screenshots, right? They're hard to, to read even on a good projector. Sometimes the projector is so bad, like I, I feel bad for people in the room because they, they cannot see anything. So I looked at it, I was like, wow. And I see that this is a link to Code Sandbox. And I apologize from people who are competing with Code Sandbox for showing this. But I opened the project, and I looked, and I was like, oh, they're using to do MVC app CSS version 2.3.0. Hmm. And just to be sure, I cloned the sandbox, and I changed it to 2.2. .2, so this is how 2.2 .2 looks. You see? Nice. Ooh. Nice. Ooh. <laughs> and so I was looking at this, and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember. I did this. I actually submitted a pull request a long time ago to the to do MVC app CSS package fixing the contrast. Now, if you look at the body of a message, I'm saying that here's a change, here's a screenshot. The screenshot actually doesn't show the red very well, but it's there. And, and here's a link to the test where I tested this change using Cypress and Cypress X plugin by Andrew Van Slars, my former coworker. So that's nice. I use Cypress to fix something that I'm using to demo Cypress. And this is how a typical test for contrast looks. This is more complicated thing where you visit a page, inject X library, then you actually change the page so you have something meaningful to test. You add a couple to-dos, you check with two to-dos, and then you actually you know, check the contrast. And that will throw an error if any contrast there is not accessible. So, I did that, and then I was like thinking about this, like, yeah, actually, to do MVC itself, but people who show to do MVC implementation in different languages and diff using different frameworks and libraries, they use Cypress now. So that's nice. Even Christian Alfoni, right, when he talks about his libraries, like Cerebral and Overmind, he says, use Cypress.js. And I'm showing these slides using slides.com. And you know what? They use Cypress to test this stuff. 
And I just want to say that we open source it two years ago. And in two years, Cypress became one of the most popular end-to-end -end test runners in the whole community. And to be there from you know, the time when we were just four people, never knowing if we're going to survive next like, six months because you know, we were living like, paycheck to paycheck, raising money, growing as a team, seeing so many contributors to both test runner and documentation and recipes and examples. I just want to say thank you. OK. Thank you? It, saying thank you costs us nothing. This is how we want to say thank you, right? So we introduced an open, open source plan specifically for open source organizations and projects. So you can just apply, and we'll give you all the features from our dashboard for free. And I think it's pretty nice. Thank you. We want every project to bloom like that flower. Uh, so 62 organizations. I just saw that today two more were approved. And so it's nice. I, I think it's, get ad it's getting adopted. Um, like OctaKit, the REST API is using with Spectrum and, and others. OK. What are we working on as a company? So we have two parts of a company, right? We have the dashboard that actually pays the bills and the test runner, our back contribution to the open source community where we have uh, right now six full-time employees working on that, plus all the outside contributors. So on a dashboard, if you're a company and you've been testing for a while, you want to know how the tests progress, how they change over time. So we're working on analytics. And I know analytics is kind of boring, right? But seeing progression in your company over time and which tests fail and how the timing changes, and the benefits of parallelization versus you know, the new software. I, I think it's important. It allows you to make an intelligent decision in regards to your testing needs. Even uh, attribution, right? Who's writing tests? Which tests are failing? Which branches are failing more often than others? Which test environments are flaky? Allows you to actually invest time and maybe upgrade your staging environment so they're not flaky as, as much. More realistic uh, users were you know, tagging tests, right? Where you want to say, this run is for my nightly build, or this run is for my, for my European build of my website. So you can add tags, and this is work in progress, but this is how it's going to look, and then quickly filter your views and find which uh, tags, the tags that matter to you. You don't have to take pictures of this. The slides are all already there, so. The interesting thing is that we decided, rather than us kind of working on this in, in the darkness, <laughs> right? We're just going to put it on a, a product board, and people can see how the features are you know, looking right now, can come in, and so on. So every user input that we see from Slack, from email, from Twitter, from personal discussions, right? We kind of throw into the uh, product board, so it becomes actionable, and it's remembered, and we can make informed decisions. And it's not a decision by our personal preferences in a, in a vacuum. Um, of course, product board uses Cypress and loves it. So, uh, for test runner, for test runner, the most important thing is this. Uh, right now, when you run Cypress, it comes. It's an Electron app, so it comes built with built-in bundled version of Electron, which is kind of like old Chrome. And we're working on upgrading it. But also, Cypress can find other Chrome-based uh, browsers on your system. So if you have Chrome, Chrome Canary, it will find it, and you'll be able to like, say, I want to run my tests in Chrome, which is great, because now you have a modern browser. Um, and we've been saying, these are functional tests. As long as your tests pass consistently in Chrome, what else can you want? right? But for some reason, people did not accept that as an answer, right? And then we said the same thing again and again. And still, some people were arguing, no, I want my tests to pass in other browsers like Firefox, Safari, you know, Brave. And, and at some point, we just give up. We're like, OK, we'll do it. So we re-architectured how like, our commands communicate with a browser, how we control the browser, so we can 
add support for multiple browsers in a consistent and easily maintainable way. So what you see right now is up-to-date status of a pull request that adds Firefox support. Because Firefox was like the most popular thing that developers were asking for. So right now, out of 3,000 tests that we run in the actual browser, only 15 are failing. So I think it's pretty, pretty close. And once we release Firefox, the next one that people are asking is IE 11. Yeah, so <laughs> I think the, the day we release IE 11, like I submit my resignation. I give them two hour notice and I'm like, no, no. Um, no, so uh, why people are asking for IE 11, right? It, it's not us. The focus is not on developer, just like with tests. The focus is on the customer. If a customer is willing to pay, and who is willing to pay? Large corporations. And what do large corporations want to support for no particular reason? IE 11, right? At least IE 11 and not like IE 9 or 7, right? That would be a total disaster. Um, by the way, support for new IE Edge, the one that uses Chrome engine, was done by a user, right? We haven't merged like the little thing that needed to be changed, but it's completely a user space solution, which is just mind blowing, right? How easy it is. Um, after E11, we're thinking about mobile Safari, because majority of differences is not even between desktop browsers that are evergreen, it's between desktop and actual mobile Safari. On a personal note, our personal dashboard we are testing it using Cypress, and in two years we found probably three instances where our test did not catch a cross-browser bug. And one bug was in Firefox, another one is Safari, and the third one was Chrome itself. We did not run that particular test in Chrome itself. It only ran it on Electron, and there was some weird issue with video not playing. So, on our personal note, I think when we release Firefox, will you run your 1,000 tests in Chrome and then the same 1,000 tests in Firefox? I don't think it's a good strategy. I think you're going to just waste time running both sets of tests in both browsers. But I think maybe some targeted tests that kind of exercise a lot of code paths would be nice to run in Firefox. And how do you know which tests actually exercise a lot of code paths? probably for code coverage. Um, second thing, so when a test fails, Cypress will show you an error, you see the website iframe on the right and you see the command log with all the commands from the test um, on the left. So you can see that in this case visited the site, type, type, and then for some reason expected to have two items but got four. So there is an error, the error is readable but not the best one. Um, for example, you don't know like, what's the source of error, right? Like what's particular thing that failed? And also the error itself, especially if you have large objects and you say this array should be equal to this or this object should be deep equal to that, like we didn't have very good diffs. What you can do when you're in interactive mode, you can open your dev tools and when you click on the error, you will actually get more information in DevTools, but in a screenshot you don't see that, and it's extra step. So we all started thinking about this with just me saying, hey, every error where a command like type fails, in an error message, can we please add a link like to go to the type docs, like our documentation site, just open a browser, just, just do that so that our users can quickly look up how to use type. So that's how we started. What we ended up was, a lot of things. So for example, if, our, if your application is throwing an error, not, not our test, but your application throws an error, we'll show you the source of error, right? That includes source map. If it's an error in our assertions, we completely rework how we're doing the diffs, so the diffs are more intelligent and can show you like, you kind of like you know, git diffs, targeted information, and if you click, it will expand. And in Cypress command itself, it's easy when a command fails, but sometimes the command can have another command. Maybe your front-end test calls the back-end task to do something to check 
So in that case, you have multiple places where the error occurs. So we want to show everything. And the thing that we are very excited, and I'm really excited, is that the error explanation will be much, much better. And it will have, every error will have a doc link where you can just click and immediately go to the documentation page. And not just for commands, but for specific errors as well, where you will understand. And also, we really, really spend too much, way too much time on source maps. And for only one reason. So we're showing you the fragment of source where the error happens. We really work hard so when you click on that, it opens your text editor specifically at that location. Like this took so much time, but I think this will be, will be a killer feature where a failure leads directly to the source place in a right text editor. Except for Vim, we'll never. Okay. And the final thing that I wanna show what we're working on which is very close to being released. No matter what you do, when you test the complete system, it's a complete system that's very, very complex. Think about internet. You're trying to control a browser, a browser that's unbelievably complex piece of code, which tries to use the internet that over 30 years devolved into this morass of servers, frameless, what, what unbelievable amount of complexity, where certain parts can fail at any moment, which hit your backend. The backend is complex. So despite your best design of your software and your test, some tests can still flake. Like, that's a fact. So what do we do? Do we stop the whole build and say, well, you had 100 spec files, each one with 10 tests, so you had thousands of tests. Stop the build because this particular test, checking the color of a button, failed. But when you run again, it just passes again because that was just some transit fluke in CSS load. No. So we decided to do test retries the right way where you can set a config option, say, hey, if a test fails, retry that test up to, let's say, three times. And of course, this requires a lot of changes under the hood, how we keep track of tests and how we show them. So in this case, it shows that this particular test on the first try out of three failed but it passed on a second. And when you click on a failure, it will open up and so you can actually see where it failed in the first try. And completely optional feature, but I think it will make a lot of difference to large organizations that run a lot of tests. So I showed our dashboard, what our test runner is working on. It's all work in progress. But if I can leave you with one thought at the end, you should give Cypress a try. So if you're not using Cypress right now, just try it out. Give it an hour. If there are no blockers, then I think you'll be successful later. Usually an open source project that has, well, to be honest, I don't know the precise number, but it's well above 1,000 open issues. If you go to our GitHub, I would run away like saying this project is bad. But I think the number of open issues for Cypress is not the degree how broken it is, but just the complexity of a task at hand. We literally have issues open for every permutation of operating system, CPU architecture, network stack, uh, backend stack, front end framework or library, and just like big X of unknown other factors where we just say. So basically, people are trying to use it in many, many ways and finding the issues in the browser behavior library behavior, unspecified HTML specs, and so on and so on. So don't be scared, give Cypress a try. If you're using or working on open source project and you need resources for running end-to-end -end tests, we are there for you. you know, we'll give you a free uh, plan. And finally, like, the future is bright. I think the browsers are moving in the right direction. Despite what we think about them, I think the future of um, web application programming is super bright. No matter what you do or what language you prefer, I think the tools are getting better and we hope to contribute to the testing tools being better. So thank you very much, tweet at us. Um, if you use mobile app for the conference, if you go to the session, if you scroll all the way down, there is a link you can give anonymous feedback to me, right? Or if you, you know, want your name attached, just talk to me or tweet at me or send email. Thank you very much, thank you.